Wow, thank you. Good morning. Welcome to our Sunday worship service. It's good to see each and every one of you here. Thank you for being here. Uh, we have a few announcements today. Uh, there'll be a special board meeting next Sunday at 11. And the purpose is, um, the purpose is to approve repairs. Uh, Sheila had some keys sticking or some contacts sticking on the organ and to get those proactively repaired so we don't have to wait for each one to stick like it did a couple Sundays ago. That was kind of an adventure. Uh, so then the other thing is to put a couple of small rails here on these steps so people can safely get up the, get up the steps here. So those two topics will be in the board meeting next Sunday. Then also uh, we'll have a cabinet meeting next week at 11. So we'll sort those two, th those two conflicting things out. Immediately following the church service for the board meeting and then at 11 for cabinet meeting. Any other announcements? Our flowers today are from Doug and Marcia Nelson. They wish everyone a happy Valentine's Day. So I th think that might be it. So please stand as you're comfortably able and let's join together in our opening hymn number two. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Join in our call to worship. Come and learn the ways of life. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who persecute you. Do unto others as ye would have them do unto you. Let us pray. Merciful and gracious God, we gather as your children, trusting that we will hear your voice speaking wisdom into our lives today. We give thanks that you have called us to this place for reading your word, singing your praises, and offering our prayers on behalf of those who are sick and for the whole world. Help us listen and learn, even as we celebrate what you've already done in our lives. We are grateful for your continued blessings 
And we give you praise and we ask for your guidance and protection. Lead us in all that we do this morning. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Our Gospel reading today is from the sixth chapter of Luke, starting with verse 17. He came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their masters did to the false prophets. Now this is one of those texts that's hard for us to get our arms around. If we just read the assigned lectionary verses, we don't have the context in which Jesus delivered this sermon to his disciples. In the verses right before our reading, Jesus had spent the entire night up on a mountain in prayer. He had some big people decisions to make. So he gets away from everybody and he prays all night about who he should choose as his apostles. And he comes down the mountain, which kind of echoes Moses coming down the mountain with the Ten Commandments, and he approaches three main groups of people, and they're all mixed together. The scene for our reading is the twelve selected apostles, a bunch of other disciples, usually in scripture that, that's a group of seventy or so, close followers of Jesus, and then a great crowd of people who have heard of Jesus' teaching ability and his ability to heal the sick. And that larger group has traveled from as far away as a hundred miles. So most likely Jesus would have been tired. He was praying all night about sele the selection of these twelve apostles. And in the verses right before this, it names the, who the twelve apostles are. So he chooses those from that bigger group of disciples. And he gets bombarded then by the press of the crowd as they seek healing. And Luke says that power was going out of Jesus. So it's in this tired and distracted condition that Jesus gets the apostles' attention and tells them that the road ahead is going to be bumpy. And he talks to them straight. He doesn't fluff up or sugarcoat the life that they're getting themselves into. Jesus seems to be saying, forget what you're used to, this is going to be a totally different deal. A different language to speak, different priorities, different ways of valuing people and time and talents. And Luke recalls Jesus' sermon a little bit differently than Matthew does. This collection of four beatitudes and four woes is called the Sermon on the Plain. And if you have some extra time and you don't mind having your overall understanding of the world messed with, I recommend reading Matthew chapters 5 to 7. In that Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives eight beatitudes or sayings describing who all will be, be blessed and uh, along with some of the how and the why. But here in chapter 6 of Luke's Gospel, we see just the four beatitudes and then four parallel woes where the specifics are reversed. Now those woes are not supposed to necessarily suggest inevitable or inescapable doom. Woe in these verses could be translated with compassion rather than judgment. Like, you're in trouble if you trust in riches or it would really be too bad if you put your appetites at the top of your priority list or watch yourself if you're only out to have a good time or not so fast there are more important things than being popular. So in general the instruction by Jesus to leap for joy when hated and persecuted it, it doesn't really seem to be a good recruitment method or a good more motivational speech for these new employees. 
Jesus is telling the disciples that their lives are going to go from hard to harder. From our modern management science perspective, that may not be the best way to attract and retain new talent. So what's going on here? Well, Jesus says that there's a better way coming. There is a kingdom of heaven reality that has to be considered in our day-to-day -day here on earth living. Like Dorothy, we're not in Oz anymore. Jesus may have been telling his apostles, you assume that making a living and getting ahead and saving for a rainy day are the best rules and practices for life. Jesus told them instead that there's a bigger and a better set of priorities. Now maybe you've been, when you went away to college or when you went from middle school to high school or moved to a new state or something, you had a big disruption in your life and in the, what you were comfortable with and the way you looked at the world. For me, it was the day I arrived at boot camp. That had been a really long day and they put us into a group of about 80 and we got to sleep about 2 o'clock in the morning. Then we were rudely and very loudly awakened about 4.30 in the morning by assistance to the company commander. That's kind of the Navy's version of a Marine drill sergeant. And what they did is they took empty tra metal trash cans with the lids on them and they hurled those down the aisle. And, it was, and then they went along bellowing, fall out on the grinder. And those gentlemen repeated that phrase over and over at tip top volume. And none of us new and bewildered recruits had any idea at all what they meant. So we were all half asleep and trying to process the odd language and the obnoxious behavior. And this wasn't in our realm of experience at all. So our world was turned upside down. And we needed to change our priorities and our values and our very way of thinking. So what these helpers meant was that we were required to get dressed quickly and go outside where we needed to organize ourselves neatly in rows on this asphalt pavement that had been set aside for learning how to march. And falling out on the grinder became second nature to us in a very short period of time. And this no-nonsense way of becoming introduced to everything, that became a normal pattern and a core piece of the hurry up and learn that was at the heart of boot camp. So here in chapter 6 of Luke's Gospel, Jesus is blurting out some honest but unusual assessments for his newly named apostles to absorb. As by chapter 9, Jesus is already sending them out two by two so they can try out the work of being itinerant preachers on their own. Now the four Beatitudes that Jesus tells the apostles, the nearby disciples and the eavesdropping crowd, are mostly describing a future view. He describes how things will be when all is said and done. The kingdom of heaven arrived on earth with the birth of Jesus, but it isn't all the way finished yet. Now these four blessings and woes have been a here and now, they have a here and now sense and an eternal sense. Uh, theologians call that still in process, happening but not finished world, the already not yet. The kingdom has arrived with Jesus' incarnation and ministry, but it isn't fully realized yet. So Jesus isn't chewing the disciples out here, I don't think. He had just called them. He's spitting out a level set, you might say, which warned them that things were going to be completely different than what they were used to. They were being called to do kingdom work, and they should expect new language, new priorities, new ways of looking at the world. God's kingdom was among them, but it wasn't finished yet. Now in these verses we see the poor compared to the rich, the hungry compared to the full, the weeping compared to the laughing, and the outcasts or those who are persecuted compared to those who were popular and accepted. And like the disciples, we are residents of two places at once. We live in our modern world, and we live in God's partly arrived kingdom. So when we're driving, we look out the windshield as well as looking at the dashboard or at the road just ahead of the car. And we need to pay attention to the immediate as well as to the near future and the distant future all at the same time. 
It's kind of like when you wear bifocals. We're altern alternately looking near and far through our bifocals. And we need both views to navigate life well. It's the same way with spiritual life. Current conditions won't last, so we don't want to pin our hopes on temporary things alone. So in this dual state, there are going to be tensions. Now there are physical or socioeconomic overtones in these verses, but there are also spiritual currents. Matthew's version of the Beatitudes doesn't limit the poor to those without money, but specifies, blessed are the poor in spirit. Even in the middle of loss and trouble, as we realize that we're blessed, we can still experience joy. We leap for joy as we realize that we're fully dependent on a dependable God. Not because of the negative aspects of persecution or poverty or other concerns directly. The word used in scripture which is translated leap for joy is the same word that Luke used in chapter 1 as he describes Mary telling her cousin Elizabeth about carrying the Christ child. John the Baptist leaps for joy in Elizabeth's womb. And we leap for joy in body or in our hearts because we grasp the fact that our reward for faithful living will be joyous. We have promises from God that we can hold on to. We are blessed and that is the reason for our joy. Now in reality we don't land fully in one camp or the other. Most of the times we're in the blessed camp and in the woe camp at the same time. And another way to interpret these terms is to substitute happy for blessed and unhappy for woe. And I've also seen this translated uh, lucky in place of blessed and unlucky in place of woe. But being poor isn't a guaranteed way to be blessed and being rich isn't automatically the road to woe. Jesus is telling his disciples, you guys are now my followers. You're in training and we don't have much time. I'm going to give you a crash course in gospel living. Please pay attention. You'll see me get some pretty rough treatment, Jesus tells them, and I want you to know that you'll get treated pretty badly at times too. Even so, as you remember these words, you can recall that bad treatment could be a clue that you're on the right path as my followers. In each of these four beatitudes and woes, present conditions get turned around in the future. Luke uses this pattern of reversal over and over in his gospel. This just seems to be his writing style. The things aren't what they seem on the surface. Now we're supposed to invest ourselves in looking at it from all from the perspective of Christ. As followers, we're called to love and forgive others just as Christ loves and forgives us. So the trouble with wealth and abundance of food and celebration and popularity is that those conditions may lead us to say, this is as good as it gets. Now it can seem harsh to say, but in the long run, we're better off having some struggle in our lives. So it isn't so much that the rich, the well-fed, and the popular are getting an F in life, according to Luke's four woes. It's more that they're at great risk of getting an I for incomplete. They might be satisfied with having a lot and getting recognized. Then that, in turn, can stifle their search for a richer and a fuller measure of the blessed and abundant life that God promises to followers of Jesus. Now back to our driving analogies, distracted driving is a big problem these days. And I think that can be a helpful image for us in this context. In the context of Luke's four blessed characteristics and four woes or warnings. Now we can't just cruise along on autopilot. We have to be vigilant. It's like Jesus was telling his new recruits and a bunch of the crowd too, may I have your attention. This isn't going to be business as usual, he seems to be saying. This isn't going to be easy. We'll have different goals and values and priorities from what you're used to. And some of this won't make much sense to you until later on. And he tells them that kingdom principles can run counter to what they've been taught all their lives. The old rules and ways that come naturally to them 
may not work out very well in this new approach to living. Now in boot camp, we learned that we weren't autonomous beings. They drilled into us that we're part of a larger community and a larger mission. So we had to learn new language, new values, a new view of authority, new skills, and new approaches to teamwork. And it wasn't much fun. Most of us had buyer's remorse over signing up. And we counted down the days until we could get out of there. But we did learn. We did have our perspectives changed. So they accomplished their goal to wake us up to a larger mission. And there are parallels for our lives with Jesus' goal in delivering this Sermon on the Plain. If we're going to be treated like the Old Testament prophets, we'll need to read up on their lives. If we're going to be poor, hungry, excluded, and unpopular, then we need to understand and prepare for the implications. As we apply Jesus' teaching to our own circumstances, we can begin to recognize what it means to be blessed. If we see indications that we're going in the right direction, we can feel the joy of our calling. We can recognize that our path is leading us toward a renewed understanding of the kingdom of God. And when things look upside down to us, we can assume that we're on to something. We might be filled with joy and feel blessed to have what you might call aha moments as we detect God's hand at work in the middle of our blessings and our woes. Now Jesus isn't really emphasizing the specifics of being poor, filled, hungry, and sorrowful, and popular, and so on here. This passage of scripture tells us that Jesus was a source of healing power for the crowd. And he was using that backdrop to tell his closest apostles and the larger group of disciples that the way of the kingdom is not the way of the world. Now maybe we need shocking statements like these to help us adjust our vision to the horizon. It's so easy to focus our attention on the, the shiny objects of our consumer culture and misplace our hunger for the blessings of the spiritual life. We can too easily settle for the here and now instead of grabbing on to the joy and blessing of Jesus' larger vision that's described here in these verses. We can leap for joy, either literally or at least in our hearts, as we see confirmations that the gospel is true and that an upside-down reading of the world is showing us that Jesus' description of the kingdom, are, those descriptions are actively playing out. Now we have risk when we're too content with how things are going because we're on a lifelong spiritual journey. We might not grow as much if everything goes smoothly for an extended period of time. So Luke's woes are a reminder to us that we have to keep in mind that uh, not so fast caution that Jesus gave them and keep the eternal perspective in mind as we go through the days and we go through the trials of our lives. So Jesus had a different message for the apostles knowing that they would be treated the same way that he was being treated. They would follow in his footsteps and they would share his fate. So he spoke the truth in love. He was saying, you guys are now my followers. You'll take over for me and get the same treatment the prophets of old got and the same treatment that I get. It isn't fair, but with the right vision, you'll recognize that the path seems so, that seems so hard is leading to the very kingdom of God. Jesus tells them, in effect, I'm with you. Hang tough. Have faith. Hold on tight to your hope. Now much of Paul's writing explores the balance between grace and law. The Old Testament prophets knew the law and they spoke truth to power, telling woes to the common people and to kings alike. Now we can use warning lights on our road too, but there's more to the story than law and woe. There's grace. Because, God, because of God's abundant grace, we are blessed and happy and some even argue that lucky is an accurate and a theologically acceptable term to use. So this is a really big deal for us. We are blessed. 
Jesus came to give us abundant life. Like the apostles, the path that seems so hard to us is leading us to the very kingdom of God. Now if we were all in the seventh grade, I'd say we're sitting at the cool kids table. Even when we feel persecuted, set aside, hungry for a better way, we can still have joy. Jesus' message to us is that we're truly and abundantly blessed. We're called to rely on God. It's all going to work out well. We are justified in choosing joy. Jesus is with you. Hang tough. Have faith. Hold on tight to your hope. Amen.